2022. It's here with a bang. We've dragged in our favorite Canadian out of the cold. Welcome back, Brent. Hello, everyone. And Chris, as always, how are you doing? Happy New Year, sir. Hey, you know what? I want to say thank you to uh, the team that stepped in for the holiday 3D printing episode. That was a lot of fun. And now, I mean, it feels like I haven't done this forever. Like, yeah, I who are you again? A, a what is, what, what yeah. is this thing in front of my face? Well, I thought maybe if I brought Brent with me, I'd be accepted back. Maybe. We'll Did see. The jury is still out <laughs> on that one. It always works with Alex. <laughs> <laughs> the quickest way to Alex's heart is through a Brent. Oh. It's true. Also, uh, video games. You know, my favorite game of all time, I think, is probably Factorio. But I potentially have a new one, which is vying for a top spot at the moment. It's called Anno 1800. Have either of you played this game? Oh, this is the first I hear of it. Yeah, same. What kind of game is this? It's a city builder where you manage like supply chains and that kind of thing. Um, oh, it sounds like it's up your alley. You're pretty much playing as the East India Trading Company, minus the slavery part. So that's kind of nice. But yeah, you just trade goods back and forth and build cities. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun, relaxing, single player game. When was this released and how'd you hear of it? Uh, ages ago. I don't know when it was released exactly, but uh, I think I heard about it first when Linus of uh, Tech Tip fame mentioned it on one of his videos, and I thought, oh, I'll go and check it out, and downloaded a demo and liked it, so I bought it. It's kind of great when you discover a game that's been out for a while, so that means it's got a couple of patches under its belt. You can find stuff online. There's a community. It's sort of a sweet spot. You know, you know, a game doesn't have to be cutting edge brand new for, for it to be enjoyable. Absolutely not. Speaking of stuff that's no longer cutting edge and brand new, I thought I'd just do a quick bit of follow up on the uh, Linux Unplug predictions episode. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make the recording of this year's predictions episode itself, but I thought I'd follow up on the prediction I made last year about 20 terabyte hard drives uh, being available, I think, for 250 bucks at Best Buy. That didn't quite pan out. No, it didn't quite, did it? No. I mean, there was a few shenanigans going on that kind of scuppered my my plans. First of all, supply chain. Obviously, we all know at this point what's going on with the supply chain. But second of all was Chia. We had a hard drive mining crypto coin come out of the woodwork. Yeah, there's just no way with all that was going on that was going to happen. You think maybe you got a better shot this year? No, but I'm just going to say it anyway. <laughs> I mean, I was trying to, you know, with this Anno 1800 game, I've got a, a 1080 Ti graphics card, which I've had for several years now, uh, which was actually incidentally paid for originally by Bitcoin mining four years ago. And now with this Anno 1800 game, I've been looking for a new GPU and I was looking, you know, just uh, to see what was out there. The cheapest 3080 that I could find was on Facebook Marketplace near me for $1,800. <laughs> What is going on with that? <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah, we've been building a new replacement server here, and the the number one cost, because the audience has been so awesome by providing the, the main rigs, has been storage, and the, just a limited amount of storage. So I had to buy a batch of two terabytes and a batch of four terabytes. I wanted all four terabytes, obviously, and I had to buy them all used, which I'm not super comfortable with. Um, but it's going to be in an array, in a raid array. So hopefully if one or two pops, we'll be all right, but they're all used this and, you know, we paid a fair amount for them, even buying in the after, you know, whatever you call it, the lightly loved market, I assume, because they're enterprise drives. So I hope, I hope they'll last. I've just recently learned about this whole hard drive used market. Is this Alex, you think something worth even considering? I mean, how cheap are we talking? A uh, 14 terabyte, so here, here's my reference point, a 14 terabyte easy store that I can shuck from Best Buy. I think I picked one up before Christmas for about $190, $200, something like that. I think it's also what is your risk tolerance and do you have a setup that can tolerate one or two drives at least failing? Yeah, that makes sense. So the new server... Do we keep that in mind? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can we can sustain a couple disks failing. I think in total it, we're okay until three fi fail simultaneously. Um, and I normally wouldn't think that's likely, except for these are probably all originally from the same manufacturing batch. 
They're all the same exact hard drive, the same exact model, all bought at the same exact time. <laughs> I thought that was a rule not to do that. I'm pretty <laughs> sure there's a, a rule against that, like the bathtub curve or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, beggars are definitely not choosers. And in this case, that's what we got. Have you considered calling your buddy Alex over here and shipping him a couple of hard drives and then you could use some of his basement space as a off-site backup? Maybe we could do that. That'd be a fun project. Now, I know this is a lot of power, but what about a full server, potentially? Why? Well, because I think I might have one that I'm going to totally sync. <laughs> okay. And, I, I mean, <laughs> but why? you know. <laughs> I think he has more servers than hard drive space. You're pretty off-site, you know? That's a good off-site backup, you know, in terms of off-site backups go. One in the east, one I in the mean, yeah. if, a, if a nuke hit DC, would it come out as far as Raleigh? Probably. I don't know. I mean, if that happens, I think I probably got bigger problems, really. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. You're on the West Coast. I don't think the, the fallout would make it quite that far. I'm joking. Of course, there'd be bigger problems than that. There's one or two mountains between us, I suppose. A Maybe couple. I'll do all right. And then really life should just go on as normal. There would be no other repercussions. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, if, if the uh, federal government disappeared tomorrow, I don't think anybody would be too upset. Do you? No, I, I'd just vote with blockchain. I think that's what happened. Uh-oh. So was that your prediction? Was it uh, 200? With, what was it? I, I, I think I missed the prediction. A 20 terabyte easy store for $250 or less. Okay. Okay. Can I ask you what you think, Alex, your success rate might be? Zero percent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But he's doing it anyways. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I was pretty confident about it. But uh, I don't know. The way things are at the minute and, you know, chip shortages and all that kind of stuff. I'm not so sure anymore. But, you know, can't blame a guy for trying. No. What about diminishing returns when it comes to hard drive? Like, I don't know. A squeezing that much data into tiny like it's a physical space is there any a terabyte is a terabyte yeah but i guess what i'm saying is is there any physical limitation to how far this can go oh there's been a lot of innovations in that space for better or for worse for sure yeah they they do all sorts of shenanigans to to fit more bits and bytes and stuff onto a single platter um you know that's way beyond what i think about generally on on the regular uh, i think about how much space i can fit into a single drive slot and for, for me and my backup server, for example, I've, I've just built a new backup server that has five hot swap drive bays. And so for me, I want to be able to cram as many terabytes into those five slots as I can. So trying to get the most terabyte per slot for me is, is the name of the game. Yep, I totally agree. So Santa brought you a few gifts and some of them speak HomeKit. And uh, this is a topic we've danced around on the show because we appreciate not everyone listening even cares about this kind of stuff. You've been prepping for this episode for years. Yeah. You know, honestly, before I gave Home Assistant a go, I gave HomeKit a go. Like, I just tried to do everything with HomeKit because there's, there's things I like about it. If you're not familiar, it's, it's basically a software framework that Apple created that exists in the iOS ecosystem and now the Mac. And it allows for land-based smart automation and device controls. And it's because it's land-based, it's really quick. And because it's Apple, it's integrated into the OS and it's integrated into any of the Siri speaker devices and anything that you can invoke Siri on, you can control a HomeKit device with. So that it kind of opens it up to a pretty wide ecosystem. Even the Apple TV remote can be used to control HomeKit devices. And of course, Apple builds HomeKit automations into their Shortcuts app on the iPhone so you can build automations in your smart home using the Shortcuts app, just if you really live in that ecosystem. But obviously, because it's Apple's ecosystem, it's a big sandbox, but it is absolutely a sandbox and it does have walls. So absolutely, I'm, I'm already bumping up against those walls on, you know, day 10, 10 or whatever of my uh, iOS transition. You know, I've I've been using Android for the best part of a decade and figured I'd give the iOS side a, a proper college try this year. So I'm I'm gonna keep going with this phone. I'm gonna try and do a year. We'll see how it goes. I am liking it so far for the most part. There's a couple of things, but uh coming back to HomeKit, uh what's really nice is how it's it's seamless, right? And when I pull down on my notification kind of control center thing up in the top right. I get a button there called home, which has some favorites within it. And 
And one of the things that came up right away without any configuration at all was my LG TV. So I can just turn it on and off straight from my phone. No need for a specific app. Yeah, as you would expect, Apple is pretty good at what they do support. It works pretty well. Uh, and HomeKit itself seems to be fairly robust. They've open sourced uh, a lot of it. Uh, it uses encryption that seems to be pretty strong. And they're promising broader integration with Matter as that develops. They're one of the partners there. So there's some things to like about it. And I think as we get into this, I want to talk about how you can integrate it with Home Assistant. I don't know if you've tried that yet, Alex. Not yet. I mean, you know that I have dozens of home automation devices around this house already. The only one that got picked up out of the box was my LG TV. Okay, well, so I think let's let's start here. I think where I want to take this is if you have family members listening that want some home automation, they're not comfortable with Google or Amazon doing cloud control services, and they're not interested in running something like Home Assistant or OpenHab or a SmartThings Hub, but they have iOS devices. Right. This is a category of user that's perfect for this because they can really get a lot done uh, here at the studio. I use home. I actually use automations with HomeKit to turn on and off the lights when I arrive and leave. I don't actually do it directly on Home Assistant. It's triggering Home Assistant devices, which we'll talk about. But the automation is actually being triggered by shortcuts on my iPhone. Also, I use that same setup to, use, to scan NFC tags to trigger automations. So there's some there's some nice things you can get without having to run a whole back end infrastructure. So what happens when Chris's iPhone isn't there? They have this concept of a hub and it's either the Apple TV or an iPad that you're willing to leave on the LAN, probably plugged in, um or a, a HomePod, big or small. They can all act as a HomeKit hub. It becomes the primary orchestrator of your HomeKit network and if you're comfortable with this, it also will act as the proxy to iCloud. So Apple establishes a secure connection between your iPhone and iCloud. So when you leave the house, you can pull down that control center and all your devices still work, all their status information still works. And when you trigger them, what's happening is a proxied request is being routed through iCloud to the HomeKit hub, which in my case is a HomePod. And then the HomePod is executing it locally on your LAN. Okay, that's that's pretty legit. Like that's similar to like the Nebucasa service, right? Right, and it's all encrypted between your HomeKit hub and your phone. So it's Apple doesn't have the key to that. So that's also another they they are they they do have the ability to exchange it. So in theory they could probably intercept it. But as far as where the encryption keys are held, it's on your iPhone or your I, iOS device, could be the watch, uh and the HomeKit hub. So how do I add things that don't have HomeKit support to this ecosystem. Can I do that? I do it through Home Assistant, but we'll get there. I wanted to mention HomeBridge. HomeBridge is really the way to do this right now. For You mentioned LG televisions. Before LG natively supported HomeKit, everyone was doing it with HomeBridge. And it was you could run it like on a Raspberry Pi, and it essentially, it'll talk their proprietary API, whatever protocol or service it might be. The bridge will talk that. And then it'll translate it to HomeKit. So it'll just show up to your iPhone as a HomeKit device. But it's really the bridge making that representation. And so people were controlling LG televisions using this bridge. And LG got wind of it. And they thought, oh, well, maybe we should work with Apple and just build in the HomeKit support. And that's how that actually started. So I don't need the Home Bridge. That's just a nice to have. Yeah. And you really don't if you're a Home Assistant user. But if you, again, if you want to go the route of, controlling stuff without the whole infrastructure of managing Home Assistant, you could use HomeKit to do 90% of what you need. And then those random cheap devices that are quote unquote smart devices that are not HomeKit compatible, you could you could run HomeBridge on your Mac or on, on a Raspberry Pi or on a Windows box or a Linux box, and you could you could get that other 10%. And it does a bunch of neat stuff that Apple's probably never going to really do, you know, as any community builds on. So there's some other advantages to HomeBridge. It's not necessary unless you want to support non-HomeKit compatible devices. Okay, well, thanks for clearing that up. The, uh, the, the terminology here is so confusing, you know, HomeKit and HomeBridge and Home Assistant, and it's kind of hard to keep all this stuff straight in your head when you're fresh to it. Why don't we come back to that in just a second? Linode.com slash SSH. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support the show. 
that's how this works. You go there, you support us, we keep on going, and it's like the circle of podcasting. It's an ecosystem, if you will. You know, Linode is how we host everything. It's also how I'll do like a quick R&D. I want to try out an open source project or I have an idea for something that I want to build. I guess back in the day, I'd, I'd like get a VM on my local machine, but those always kind of suck. And not to mention it makes my machine busy and I have to have a certain machine that's always capable of doing that. When I flip to using Linode for this kind of stuff, it changed like the kind of hardware I'm buying now. It like opened up a whole new door, man. It's really, it's really pretty great, even just for like just research and development. And then, of course, you want to flip it to production. It's the best place to do that, in my opinion. They got 11 data centers around the world. Their machines are screamers, just super fast. Lots of distributions to choose from, including now images for Rocky Linux and Alma Linux and CentOS Stream, if that's your thing. And on top of all of it, a really great user experience. Every system over there is a great value, great performance, and a nice experience setting it up. If you like to do it yourself and build it from the ground up or just deploy an image with something ready to go, like, say, Nextcloud, maybe Discourse or GitLab, they've got one-click deployments for that. And then I'm often finding that I'm taking advantage of their things like S3-compatible object storage just by using their command line client or uh, just not even having a machine in between or just using a web interface. They have all kinds of nice things like that, like a DNS manager that's going to let you get done what you need, Kubernetes support if that's the way you go, just a lot to try. And pricing is 30 to 50% cheaper than any other major cloud provider. So go to linode.com slash SSH. Get that $100 to really try it out. Kick the tires, create an account, see what I'm talking about, and support the show. linode.com slash SSH. Alex was touching on a bunch of the terminology here, but Chris, it sounds like you've put a bunch of links in the show notes. Link Ninja, and I didn't overdo it. I just tried to put the best of the best in there that helps you go through it all with screenshots and stuff like that. So if you're trying to set this up for yourself or like a family member, hopefully those will work as a resource. But Alex, I think what you really need to kind of wrap your head around is connecting HomeKit and Home Assistant. You've got such an established Home Assistant setup now that I don't really think it's worth like developing and I guess cultivating your HomeKit devices because you're essentially going to replace them with everything that's in Home Assistant when you connect it. And so every device that is in Home Assistant will now show up to your iPhone as a HomeKit device. So you connect the devices to Home Assistant, and then they show up on the iPhone. And so that means non-HomeKit devices show up, obviously. That also means things like your automations and your scripts and those types of things, even camera feeds, now also show up as HomeKit devices. Camera feeds? Yeah, it depends on the camera, of course, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I've just right now installed the HomeKit integration and I now have about 20 different devices asking me to scan a QR code and add them to the Home app. Yeah, that's why I'm saying like it's kind of easier to just, I had to just take a weekend and because I was all in on HomeKit and I just had to move them all over if I recall. Although read on it because it's been so long since I've done it that they may have changed the way it works now. But then future devices, now I just add them directly to Home Assistant. All right, so live listeners, I am going through the process of adding a camera into the Home app. I have added the HomeKit integration. Now I'm going through my notifications and adding, by scanning a QR code in the Home app on iOS, I'm adding an uncertified accessory and I get a great big warning telling me it's not secure as I do it. It's now connecting to the camera, which is in the kitchen. What's that? Kitchen hub. I don't even have a camera in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, yeah. It'll it'll try to guess. Yeah. It will try well, to continue. guess. Let's continue. Okay. Blue Iris, all cameras. And... Camera that you know of. I mean, let's be honest. Brent and I have both been in there. There's a few cameras you don't know about. Oh, it's my driveway, not my kitchen. Well, that's pretty <laughs> cool. Hey? Yeah. Now, what's nice is all your devices on your iCloud account and your family devices can get access to those. So. Catherine could have all of those devices on her iPhone. And my kids, like when they're at the RV, have access to those devices on their iPad so they can read or be in bed at night and they can just grab their iPad and turn the lighting off when they're done now, which has been great because they just discovered that on their own and I didn't even have to like tell them about it. And they have also the tablets, but now they have it right there on the device that they already have. So why not have that additional integration? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. It, it, for me, answers some of the biggest questions I had actually and I've deliberately left 
all of this research to do it's kind of live on air live on the episode to make it more exciting or something i don't know it answers some questions that i had about how to actually integrate this stuff but uh when we were talking the other day you suggested that um i might need an apple tv and i'm i know we touched on the ipad and and things like that as like a home hub why why would i need that is that for the kind of relay thing that you were mentioning yeah so the apple tv can act as that hub and it will do a fine job because it's powered on all the time and you'll probably have it plugged into Ethernet. So it's actually a really good device for that. And um, they have a low power mode for it and everything like that. And there's even some information when you go into the settings screen, you can see like uh, what its status is as far as your HomeKit hub goes. And when you put it on your network, you plug it in. If that's the first device you have, that's if you don't like, say, already have a HomePod, It'll just sort of negotiate and it'll become the leader automatically. You'll never know. You never really have to fuss. It just does it. Now, I've just tried to add my robot vacuum and it tried to pick that up as a camera for some reason. Uh, I think because of the map portion that the uh, Xiaomi RoboVac thing that I have, RoboRock S5 is the one I have. And it's trying to use that map as a camera and it's just failing and spinning. And so this isn't perfect by any stretch, but I can certainly see why this would be useful. What I would do for some of those devices is just disable them in HomeKit because like, so say you have like my sensors that have six different sensor feeds, each one of those will show up as a device in HomeKit. The humidity, like all of it just shows up as a device and some of it, there isn't like a parallel. There's nothing in the Apple world that equates to that kind of device. And so I just disable those. So it basically it's like a one-time curation where I go through and I just I take some stuff out. There's a couple different ways you can do that. I don't remember the best way, but I found it online by looking. And I I just went through one time and disabled everything that I didn't want in that HomeKit screen once. And it's been great. But yeah, there is edge cases like like, um, a device that has two camera feeds and stuff like that. But I think Apple only expects devices to have one single camera and those kinds of weird edge cases. But when you're looking for like controlling smart devices or lights or kicking off automations or scripts, it's great at that kind of stuff. Um, but it doesn't fully replace going to the Home Assistant web UI or app if you're you know, even a moderate power user. I don't think it helps either that my other primary HomeKit kind of ecosystem, the Philips Hue stuff, I recently replaced that with a Conbi 2 uh, Zigbee bridge and Zigbee buttons everywhere. So you know, the, oh, yeah. the, the couple of low-hanging fruit that I had that would have worked uh, now don't work because I've kind of taken that control back in house. But as connect, if you do connect HomeKit up all to Home Assistant, then those will show up. Those will be devices as buttons you can use uh, in HomeKit. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and so then that means also your iPad gets that, uh, your watch, and any of your Siri tubes get that. And I think the Siri tubes actually make for kind of a nice home automation voice control. It's a decent compromise. I think it's. A, a, it's not a perfect privacy story, but it's clearly better than Google and better than Amazon. Yep. I, I'm, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't part of my motivation to switch for a bit. And I like that their protocol is LAN-based. It's not API cloud-based. It's LAN-based. Now, the voice translation that, that Siri does is cloud-based, although Apple does seem to be moving to doing that on chip more and more. They do that in the latest iPhones. So it's conceivable future HomePods may do local transcription. So that that part still goes to the cloud. But once Siri realizes what you're asking for, that happens on the LAN. That happens immediately. It's faster than some of the other ones because of that. So another question I have for you. Uh, with the Nebu Casa cloud service, I can connect the Google and Amazon pucks, tubes, whatever, voice assistants to you know, react to various phrases. Uh, and I can program those, you know, with Google, for example, you do it in the Google Home app. Uh, I can create key phrases that trigger certain scripts in Home Assistant, that kind of thing. What's the equivalent in the uh, HomeKit world? That's a great question. I'm really glad you asked because I should make this point. You don't need Nabucasa Cloud or any of that to have HomeKit and Siri work together and have Siri trigger all the HomeKit stuff. Um, because it's doing it through the home kit integration and Siri is executing those commands from the, from the hub device or whatever Siri device requests it directly to the home assistant using that integration. 
So it bypasses the need for like the complicated setup to get Google Assistant to work completely. So also, I think it's just a great setup because you don't actually need the Nebuchadnezzar cloud part. You don't have to do all the cloud stuff if you don't want to. Uh, so you just get the HomeKit integration set up. And once you have uh, all the HomeKit devices associated with Home Assistant, it Siri just works. Your phone, it'll work on your phone. It'll work on your HomePod. It'll work on your watch. It'll work on your Apple TV. It all just it happens immediately. Very nice. Now, we're going to take a quick break from the Apple stuff. We'll come back to that shortly. Uh, I have a request to ask of our listenership. Um, my mother sent me a few videotapes for Christmas. They are mini DV format tapes. Uh, I rang a local video shop that does like digital or analog to digital conversions, uh, and they wanted to charge me something like $20 a tape, and I've got about 10 or 20 of these things to digitize. Uh, that seems a little bit expensive to me uh, also what seems expensive is looking on ebay at these used camcorders they're like 100 150 dollars for a 10 15 year old outdated proprietary format camcorder so i was wondering if there's anybody in the audience that has any suggestions about how i could acquire a mini dv camcorder for cheaper than 150 dollars or would be willing to loan me one for a few weeks that'd be kind of cool and uh, if you have any suggestions about how to actually go ahead and digitize the uh, tapes properly, please let us know at selfhosted at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Tailscale.com slash selfhosted. Go there to get a free personal account for up to 20 devices and you support the show. Yeah, it's Tailscale. It's a zero config VPN. It installs on any device in minutes. It manages your firewall rules for you and it works from anywhere. Devices connect directly to each other using WireGuard's noise protocol encryption. It builds a mesh network with the best VPN security in the business, and it does it quickly and easily. You'll create a secure network between your servers or your computers or your cloud devices. And even when you're separated by firewall, subnets, or the dreaded double NAT, Tailscale just works. I use Tailscale to keep all of my family's computers connected. I provide them tech support. I give them access to the secure resources behind my firewall, and I have it running on everything from an Arch86 server to a Raspberry Pi with OpenSUSE Tumbleweed and my iOS devices. But for me, some of the best parts is just that every device on my network now has a stable IP. No matter where I'm at, what Wi-Fi network I'm on, or if I'm on cellular, it's always the same IP. So my bookmarks that I've set for all my different dashboards and everything work every time. And devices only connect after they sign through your existing identity provider. So you could easily enforce multi-factor authentication and you can deauthorize the machines you need to. Maybe an employee's moved on or so forth. And the fact that my Tailscale VPNs are always on and work with every OS that I use and has a GUI-based ACL editor, well, that's just like icing on the cake. It's dead simple to use and it's fast. That's the main reason I liked it. And I ended up using it every single day. So go try it for yourself for free. Up to 20 machines and support the show at tailscale.com slash self-hosted. That's tailscale.com slash self-hosted, one word. Hey, Chris, I've got good news. The NVIDIA Shield, our favorite video player, has been updated to Android TV 11. It has a Stadia button now. Wait, are you serious? No, I mean, it's apparently, according to 9 to 5 Google, yeah. Oh, boy. And they didn't get rid of the ads either. I went and looked for a screenshot. It still has no, the ads no. on the interface. That home, that kind of home launcher thing is uh, its all money, baby. You know, I don't know what is going on, but I was trying to watch Deadwood, and I have the NVIDIA Shield in the bedroom, and I don't, I don't watch TV back there a lot, but I, you know, I was going to, just for whatever reason, we were watching TV back there that night. And I hit play, and I start watching it, and about five minutes in, it starts buffering. I'm thinking, what the hell's going on here? So I pull up the Raspberry Pi on, you know, SSH on my phone in my bed like a like a lazy bastard. And uh, I pull up HTOP and sure enough, Plex is chugging away, transcoding. And so I go get the information in the playback and it says that the audio codec is unsupported. And so it's transcoding the entire thing, even the video, because the audio codec, whatever it is, I, I, I don't know, is unsupported on the shield. But shockingly, it doesn't have to transcode it for playback on the Apple TV. So I can't imagine what codec the Apple TV has that the NVIDIA Shield doesn't. 
But uh, I kind of designed my Plex setup to never transcode because I'm doing it on a Pi that's doing like a thousand other things. <laughs> so once it starts transcoding, all bets are off. You know, that TV watching session gets wrecked. <laughs> I think the NVIDIA Shield, we did an episode on it a long time ago, but it is the single longest running piece of hardware in my entire house near enough. I think I've got a Unify access point and an NVIDIA Shield that all date from 2014, 15, something like that. And I haven't replaced or upgraded either of them. It's like the Android LTS. Right? I think it helps that it's the same chip that they used in the Nintendo Switch, though. Yeah, and and a couple of uh, NVIDIA devices they sold to OEMs, too. So I'm sure they still have engineers working on drivers and getting Linux running on there. So, I'm yeah, I'm keeping mine for now, but I am tempted to replace it because of this codec issue. Although it really hasn't been a problem in the past, so... So what would you replace it with, Mr. Apple iOS boy? Well, what do you think? I actually think the Apple TV is pretty decent, especially if you only buy these things every four or five years. Um, And they don't update it very often, so they last about five years. The performance is better than even the NVIDIA Shield, and that really is saying something. This isn't supposed to be an exhaustive comparison between the Apple TV and the NVIDIA Shield. Perhaps we'll save that for a future episode. But there's a couple of things before I buy one that make me worry a little bit about doing so, um, potentially. Uh, Number one is, uh, I'll list my use cases and then perhaps you can address them. Are you talking about the Apple TV or the Shield? Uh, So I'm I'm talking about use cases I have on the Shield that I'm worried I won't be able to replicate on the Apple TV. Gotcha. First of all is iPlayer. So obviously living in the States and being British, we like to get real TV uh, from the BBC. And the way we do that is we have a WireGuard VPN that goes into one of my parents' houses in England. And our IP address is a residential IP. So, so far as the BBC are concerned, we can just stream iPlayer as if we were in that building. Uh, And there's no problems there. Whereas if you were trying to use several commercial VPNs or host something up on Linode or DigitalOcean or a and other cloud provider that ip block is kind of blacklisted by the bbc i've also heard stories that they blacklist certain models of rokus from listeners um so you know you've got to be really careful about the devices you try and do this on apparently so that's number one is how am i going to get a wire guard tunnel on an apple tv back to england and then the second one is something like cody so Cody, as I'm sure many, most of our listeners know, is is like the jack of all trades. Like if it won't play in Cody, it's a broken file type video player. Um, so for me, those two things, you know, Plex and Jellyfin, I'm assuming are both absolutely fine on the Apple TV. Yeah, those the, those are fine. Yeah, the, those are both really good questions. Um, I don't really have an answer for you on the WireGuard VPN other than solving that at the network layer, uh, which I could imagine a couple of tri- tricky ways to do that, but no particularly great ways to do that. Uh, but I could imagine a routing situation where you're taking care of that at your firewall or at, at some other device. Um, that's the only way I could think of it. I think you'd probably want to go that route because it's not unheard of to have people root the Apple TV and install third-party apps. That's been more common on the Apple TV than it is on other iOS devices. But I don't really find that to be a good long-term way to go because eventually Apple releases an OS that breaks it every time. Mm -hmm. Like you used to be able to, to your second question, there was a period of time where you could make an Apple TV a hell of a Kodi box. It was awesome. Um, But Time moved on, Apple updated the hardware and the OS requirements, and that ability went away. And uh, I have replaced Kodi with Infuse. I've mentioned it before on the show. I think Infuse is the best set-top television-style interface to video playback. It's got the best codec support. It supports Samba shares. It supports SFTP. It supports syncing to Plex and Jellyfin. It supports DLNA. It supports just attaching a disk and watching files locally. It's got tons of codecs. It has a super active de- development team. And, uh, you know, all respect to the Plex team, they're just focused on making a great video player. And, you know, they don't necessarily need to own the back end. If you want to, you know, roll it with a file system, they'll go that way. If you want to sync it to a Plex server or Jellyfin, they'll go that way. And so Infuse, for me, I even subscribe to the pro version because I think it's absolutely worth it. And um, I took about a year off from Cody. And man, I tell you what, 
I, I used to be one of Cody's biggest fans. You can find really embarrassing old videos of me on YouTube uh, where I'm really advocating Cody. Actually, man, you can even find videos of me advocating XBMC before it became Cody. Like, it's the, 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 the loyalty runs deep. I think there are videos of you advocating how to run XBMC on a PlayStation 3. Yeah. Running Linux back in the day. Do you remember DLP televisions? The ones with the like reverse projectors? Oh, that yeah, were really, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. It was 720p, baby. And we were happy, goddammit. We, yeah, it was. Uh, it was great. But I took a year off from Cody, and then I went back to it uh, last month. And, oh my God, I realized it's just from another era. Like, I think if you have momentum with it, it's fantastic. But if you take a year off and then come back to it, we don't design software this way anymore. And it does all this crazy stuff. And it has, it is, it's a lot. And Infuse, it seems simple at first. It's deceptively simple. But as you begin to use it, you realize it's very powerful. And it has a fantastic video playback engine, too which is, you know, job one here. And it's great at jumping around. The just only downside, but if you're a Jellyfin user, you're used to this. But if you're a Plex user, I think the only downside is that it doesn't have skip intro, which I love. But they do not yet support skip intro. I think it's on the roadmap. It does have a feature that Plex needs to have, and that is it blurs spoilers. So when you go into a, when you go into a show and you look at a season, it blurs the episodes you haven't watched yet, and I can't tell you how great that is. Whilst you were talking just then, I've actually gone ahead and installed it on the Mac I'm recording this on and connected up my Plex library within, what, two minutes? Uh, yeah, pretty pretty impressive. It's, it's doing something now where it's processing my files or something like that, but uh, I've got a 4K HEVC 10-bit test file that I know is uh, of a very, very high codec, and it just played instantly on my Mac. So. If you turn on the iCloud sync settings, you can then go install it on your Apple TV and all of those directories and stuff will be there on the Apple TV immediately. Uh, it may have to do some scanning, but it's, it's nice like that. And th the thing about the Apple TV is the Apple processors have been really good CPUs for, what, five years now? And so even though it doesn't have the latest processor, it's still just about better than anything else that's shipping in any other set-top box. And that includes power use. It's a low-power device, too. So it takes less power when I'm running on solar than the Shield does, which, you know, not a big difference with these devices, but I'll take every little gain I can get. Marginal gains, Chris, marginal gains. <laughs> marginal gains matter in the solar business. <laughs> yeah, they do. Well, whilst we're on the topic of media servers, I know we talked about Jellyfin a couple of episodes ago, uh, mentioned it on LUP as well, I think. And Brent, I know you've been building a Jellyfin box for your family. How's that been going? Yeah, I finally dove in. I, I I think I ran out of excuses to try Docker, try my hand at Docker, and uh, Jellyfin was a nice excuse to do that. I have to say, I think it's the beginning of a new era for me, which is very exciting. I mean, you guys are old hand at this, but um, but Jellyfin itself, I think I've been really impressed. It's the first time I really try to run a centralized media solution. And in my situation... Uh, my brother's in one home and about 90 steps away, I'm, I'm in another cabin and we kind of watch movies back and forth a lot. Um, but we share a network, which is kind of neat. Um, so I'm able to kind of optimize this thing while they're sitting there watching TV, which is kind of fun. But it just opened up a whole new world of possibility for me. I, I have always wanted to be able to, I don't know, sit at the dining room table and be able to put on my favorite album or change to, well, I feel like jazz now. And I can see Jellyfin being able to do that because you can sort of tell it to play the music on a different device. And these are maybe features that I should have had in my life a long time ago. Like perhaps you two are just laughing at me because I'm late to the game here. But um, but it's it sounds and feels really transformative, really. Well, I tell you, I'm curious because I know that we've shared Plex service with you for some time now. So you're pretty well familiar with Plex and how it feels and how it operates and its feature sets. How does it feel as a long-time user of Plex switching over to Jellyfin? Yeah, I think I'm 
I'm looking at it from a bit of a different perspective now because now I'm kind of administering Jellyfin, which I've never done with Plex. But as a pure user, um, and and I will say I have much more experience with Plex in that regard, um, it doesn't seem quite as polished, but I could see that it's starting to get there. Like occasionally, I mean, I'm 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 now using my and you know the Jellyfin app on my Android phone to browse the interface and then sort of send that to the TV, right? So I'm doing things I never did with Plex, but occasionally that connection just kind of drops down. Like the the TV portion of it will just kind of give a black screen and the interface just goes away. So there's I can definitely see some glitches that I've pretty much never experienced with Plex, I'll say. Well, inevitably, this is what usually leads someone to just get a set-top box that connects to their TV, and you just have a Plex client or a Jellyfin client on that device. And, uh, you know, that's why Alex and I think about this a lot, because you just want that to be a really nice experience. When you're sitting down, like we were sitting down to watch a movie, and uh, we were all hyped. It had been a couple of nights we'd been talking about it. We finally sat down to watch the movie. I hit play, and I had a file error. And I was able to resolve it quickly. I, I figured out what was wrong pretty quick. It probably took us about five minutes. But that is, it's so, like, disruptive because you got, you got a whole night going. It kills the momentum of the entire night for a good five minutes. And um, that's a best case scenario, you know? That's a best case scenario, five minutes. I think it's by far the time of day you want to least be doing this right. kind of troubleshooting. Right. That's how I ultimately ended up going with just Apple TV and Infuse. But I like that you're going down this route. I'm actually kind of more excited that you're playing with Docker. I think that's going to be really great, too, because that's going to open you up to a world of trying all kinds of apps. And those skills will work on any Linux box. If it's a you know a laptop, a server, or you know a VPS machine, it's the same commands and tools to install software on all of them. That sounds really nice. And I think it's also going to be a huge paradigm shift. You've both talked about how the day you kind of wrapped your head around Docker, your whole idea of how to run computers changed. And I'm really just starting that journey. For me, it was as an old IT guy that was doing this for, for you know, for years before we even had anything like containers. I mean, FreeBSD had jails, but for me, it was finally a, a real solution to separate my application from my data. That had always been something that I thought the lines blurred too much when I would set up a home server. And with, with containers, and Docker, I think, is the most widely used container technology. With containers, I, I, I finally had a really solid, reproducible way where I could blow away the application. I could completely destroy the container, pull down a fresh one. If the config was all the same in my Docker Compose, it just reconnects everything. It starts right back up. And that was the day I was like, oh, man, this means I can, I can finally move an application and its data around i can i can pick i can pick a pick all the data up off of one server drop it on a new server take that docker compose file pull down the image and it reconnects like it's always been running on that box it just fires right up and it it makes disaster recovery such a thing of beauty and it makes actually being able to move off of a box so much easier so when you need to grow and expand down the road it's so much simpler you know, I was giving this also as a gift to my brother's wife because she loves watching videos and stuff. And we don't have the greatest internet connection, as you know. And uh, so I've been ripping all of her favorite DVDs. She has just boxes of them. And so this was a nice gift to give. But the morning, Christmas morning, I thought, okay, I had stayed up late, you know, putting a bunch of stuff on there, make sure everything works. And that morning, for whatever reason, it, the interface on Jellyfin just stopped working. I couldn't. I couldn't access it. I couldn't do anything. And I oh, thought, that's brutal. oh, this is hard sinking. And I think Christmas morning is maybe not the time to be troubleshooting. But what I ended up doing was just, okay, I'm going to start from scratch. It wasn't that hard to kind of build this thing. So I'm just going to um, delete the container and, and start it over again. And I had that aha moment that you just described, which was, brought the container up and then everything was identical to the way I had left it, except it was now working. And that was the light bulb moment where I was like, oh, not only have I rescued my Christmas gift, but this is amazing. <laughs> and it just then made me realize, okay, I'm, I got to do this everywhere. There's, there's no way that I don't want to be playing much, much more with this. I do have a few questions for each of you though. 
I was constantly wanting to use the tools that I've had for many years to try to interact somehow with like t for troubleshooting. I was like, okay, this thing's not working anymore. How do I troubleshoot this thing? And I know it's a whole world, but any like beginner tips on how to interact with these containers and how to make them easy, I guess. Right. I have a web page over at perfectmediaserver.com, of course, which I'll put a link to in the show notes, which will hopefully take you through all of the basics of my ethos on why you should be thinking about using containers. Largely, it's a regurgitation of what Brent's just said. Uh, but then throughout the rest of the page, it talks about things like Docker Compose, where you get your containers from and why and how do you pick one over another and what about Podman and all those kinds of things. Um, so if you have a bunch of questions, I would direct you to that page. I'll just say quickly, just to help you get your head around it. Like you got to realize that it's own contained environment. So if you want to execute a command in there or something like that, you have to use the Docker command line tools to execute the command inside that container. The other thing that's kind of nice about Docker Compose, well, there's a lot of ways to do this, but I think Docker Compose is probably the best way for a new beginner, is when you launch an app with Docker Compose, you can do Docker Compose up. And if you don't tell it to otherwise, it'll give you the output on the screen. And you can sit there and watch the log output. Oh, that actually sounds really interesting. Yeah, it's logs. Really, but the, the key to your answer is you want logs. So however you have it, whatever tool you're using, you just want to be able to get to the logs. That's really what I wanted, and I had, I had no idea how to get to it. So I, I, I just kind of nuked the whole thing, and, and yet that gave me exactly what I was looking for. So I don't think that'll be the case every time, but um, in this case, it worked nicely. There is an alias that I use, uh, which I created a long long time ago called detail literally detail slammed together as one word um and for me what that does is it prints out the last 50 lines it tails the last 50 lines of a container's standard output so oh, that's nice one thing you'll run into with with containers is that not every app logs the standard out by default and so sometimes you'll look at the logs for that container and you won't see anything in the logs so you might need to, for that particular application, enable things like debug or error logging um, or, or higher modes, sorry, than error logging, you know, more than warning or info, those kind of things. You need to turn it up to the highest chattiness that it has in the logs. Uh, some containers that will drive your potty, other containers, it's uh, the bare minimum. Uh, traffic's a good example of where they don't put enough <laughs> stuff in the logs that they should. Um, yeah. We've mentioned it on the show before, but there's a tool called Dozzle, which will put your containers logs into a browser. And then you can search through the containers running on a specific box and look at the logs in a browser uh, if you want to do it that way as well. Well, before we go, I should mention we're doing a meetup at the end of January here at the studio, January 30th. It's a Sunday. We'll do a live recording of Linux Unplugged. And then it's a hang and chow. I have a birthday around there, so it's kind of a half birthday celebration, but I'm not making a big deal about that because I don't want people to think it's a birthday thing. I did buy some bubbly for you that I hid in the fridge. Really? So there'll have to be a it's you know adorable. a birthday pop of the cork on that one. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. If you're in the Pacific Northwest or you want to fly in on your private jet, we do have an airport nearby. You can go there. <laughs> <laughs> Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting for that. Also, thank you to our subscribers selfhoster.show slash SRE, you get some bonus content. You get a post show and it's ad free. So thank you for supporting us. And we do have the new network membership, jupiter.party. If you want to support for about the cost of two shows, if you want to support the whole network, you get all the shows. Plus you get Linux action news ad free. It's the only way to do that at jupiter.party. I'm really sorry, Chris, but I won't be able to fly in on my private jet for your birthday party. That's all right. I, I, I understand. We should really fly to you. I mean, you're the one with the newborn, so. And the weather. It's really our fault. I do. You know, you're up in the frozen tundra up in the north. You know, it's, uh, it's vaguely <laughs> warm down here at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it's rough here in Seattle. We're known for our rough winters, that's for sure. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback on uh, content ideas, things we talked about today, great apps that you're running on your network, something you just self-hosted recently, feedback on the show or sponsors, all of it, selfhosted.show slash contact. And thanks for listening, everybody. That was selfhosted.show slash 62.